Well, welcome to another edition of The Mind of Christ. We are uh, working our way through everything Jesus said and everything he did. We're using A.T. Robertson's um, Harmony of the Gospels as a guide to help us go through this chronologically. And we are in section, I think, 69 right now. It's a long section, and we're not going to finish it today. Uh, but I want to uh, direct your attention to Matthew chapter 10. And we're going to read uh, a few verses out of this, and we'll try to cover that today. But again, if you're joining us for the first time, you are in, uh, you're in the flow of a, a very long series that we began over a year ago, a year and a half ago. And there's been lots of recordings uh, on this series. And uh, you're welcome to go back and, and check our website, centralsarasota.org. And you can find all of the messages that are contained there. And I will warn you, there are many, many uh, messages found there. Uh, so we're in Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to start reading in verse 34. And I'll read down through verse uh, 39. And we'll see how far we get today. Do not think that I came to bring pre peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves his father uh, or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life shall lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Well, I'm sure we will uh, we'll make a, uh, an attempt to get through that many uh, verses today. Uh, so I'm going back into my journals. Uh, I wrote 21 journals and we're on journal number eight here. So you can see that uh, we we still have a lot, a lot to go here. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, Jesus continues to give us uh, perception regarding his mission intention. It is another irony that the Prince of Peace, when he came to make peace between all men, Jews and Gentiles by the cross, will actually become one, the one who divides even those in a household. When Jesus is Lord and everyone else is not, he must have first place. And since there is only room for one first place, family members also have to take a back seat. Here is where our minds clash with the mind of Christ. Jesus uses the phrase, do not think. Our own thinking can be so wrong and off base, based that we do not even perceive how far off we are. Jesus doesn't mean we are not free to think whatever we want. He is saying if we think his purpose was to bring peace at any price, we will be wrong. He wants peace on his terms. He is not here to negotiate with us terms of peace. We are the offenders. We are the enemy. And there is only one path to peace. One price, and he must pay it all for us. We have nothing to offer except surrender unconditionally. Eventually, all enemies will be put under his feet. He will conquer and rule with an iron scepter. We all will bow and confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we all will surrender, either voluntarily or not. Peace comes from the word Irene, E-I-R-E-N-E, -E, uh, from the more basic word Eero, E-I-R-O, it means to join. It is the opposite of war and dissension. Luke chapter 14 and verse 32 talks about terms of peace. And in that particular, uh, in that particular passage, in Luke chapter 14, uh, Jesus is talking about the, uh, the commitment that is made in discipleship. And in discipleship, 
uh, we have to realize that we have to count the cost of discipleship. And so if we see an army coming after us that has 20,000 men and we only have 10,000 men, then it's probably wise for us to realize we're not going to win that war. And so we have to count the cost. That was his point. But he, he mentions terms of peace in that passage. In Acts chapter 12 and verse 20, uh, he uses the phrase asking for peace, both referring to the, uh, uh, both of these refer to the uh, settling of a war. Um, Moses tried to be a peacemaker between two Israelites. He tried to reconcile them in peace by appealing to them as brothers, but they had observed Moses killing an Egyptian. The reconciler was a murderer. Romans 14, verse 19, we are to pursue the things that make for peace and the building up of one another. Hebrews 7 and verse 2 mentions Melchizedek, who is the king of peace, which is the word Salem, uh, which is an Old Testament term. As in Jerusalem, one of the bloodiest cities in history was known as the city of peace. Jesus did want peace when he was born. Uh, remember that the angel sang peace on earth and goodwill towards men. But because of the exclusive nature of his identity, his purpose, and his message, there was bound to be conflict with the deniers. Jesus says, you are either for or against me. But the nature of the conflict is determined by the enemies. Since Jesus told us to love our enemies, too bad our enemies do not believe in loving your enemies. Jesus contrasts peace with a sword. A sword was the most popular weapon and very personal. It always is used one-on-one, -on -one, up close. Jesus' sword is the Word of God, Ephesians chapter 6. Ironically, the Word divides and unites all at the same time. When Peter drew his sword and cut off the, an, an ear of the high priest's servant, Jesus rebuked him and said, For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Again, ironically, Jesus had drawn his own sword, and he was going to die by another sword, the sword of the state, Matthew 26, 52. Mary was told that a sword would pierce her heart or soul in Luke chapter 2 and verse 35. In this text, we learn that Jesus will be the cause of many thoughts being revealed. It reminds me of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, where it says, the word will divide the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Or in 1 Corinthians 14, 24 and 25, where it speaks of the unbeliever who comes into the assembly and by the word will have his secrets of his heart disclosed. James has put what James was put to death by the sword, Acts chapter 12 and verse 2. The jailer, uh, the Philippian jailer, nearly took his own life by the sword in Acts 16 and verse 27. In Romans chapter 8 verse 35 declares that a sword cannot separate us from the love of Christ. And in Romans 13 and verse 4, it says that the state does not bear the sword for nothing or in vain. Ephesians 6 verse 17 says that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And Hebrews 4 and verse 12 says the Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword penetrating, dividing, and judging. Hebrews 11 verse 34, the faithful could, es could escape the edge of the sword or they could be put to death by it. Hebrews 11 verse 37, the Son of Man had a sheep, had a sharp double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Revelation chapter 1 verse 16, uh, chapter 2 verse 12 and 16, and chapter 19 verse 21. Other swords are mentioned also in the book of Revelation. Well, this statement that Jesus strikes at the heart of the postmodern uh, mind whose ma mantra is tolerance, acceptance, no conflict over anything except those who have convictions based on very specific and clear teachings of Jesus. This mindset is seen in our young adults, even those who attend church and profess a deep faith. The application of that faith 
is marked by several features. Let me give you a few. First of all, those who have this kind of, uh, this kind of understanding of peace or tolerance often have a shallow understanding of Scripture and little personal Bible study experience. Secondly, those who uh, buy the postmodern uh, philosophy often avoid anything that sounds like doctrine. Doctrine is a, is a bad word uh, to the postmodern mind. Thirdly, there is a focus on worship that is praise team led, professional and contemporary. Personal worship is more spectator uh, centered than it is God centered. It is a performance often and it appeals to those who have a postmodern mind or thinking. Third, uh, fourthly, uh, another feature of this postmodern uh, thinking is, is that practical preaching heavily uh, is heavily laced with stories, few scriptures, and it does not attack the mindset of the postmodern person. And so that becomes their preferred uh, sermon is one that doesn't challenge them personally. Young people seem to be interested in spiritual things uh, the same way uh, they are about technology. Uh, it's easily adopted, and it's, if it's cool, if it's useful, and if it's stimulating. Now, I would add one more point about the postmodern mind. There seems also to be a desire to serve within the community. So we see young people living together, even while a part of a church, attending a small group because it provides social context for their life, but it's not transformational. A part of, it's just simply a part of where it is at church. Um, and that has a, a big stage in this world where people feel like that they need to be. Now, I know I'm being critical of of the postmodern mind, but I believe that what I've outlined here in these five points are uh, symptomatic of the postmodern thinking. But Jesus is about peace and a sword, not one, but both. His mission does, does both. It brings together and it also divides. It unites and it produces conflict. He builds and he tears down. His word can heal or inflict pain. Jesus does not morph to become what we want him to be. He provides the means for us to become what he wants us to be. He changes us. He warns us about thinking that he is all about peace. He is a mighty warrior, not just against Satan, but in keeping those who profess his name changing or charging forward and following uh, his aggressive lead. Jesus is serious about being followed. Jesus came, it says in the text, to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his household. I'm seeing this in the world today, but I wonder if the conflict that I'm seeing in homes is not more about sin than it is about following Jesus. In other words, I'm seeing a lot of conflict in homes today, but, it is be, but is it because some are choosing to follow Jesus and some are not? Or is it simply because people are choosing to follow their own way and they come in conflict with each other because of that? Jesus is often not at the center of the conflict unless it is the person in conflict with him uh, that brings the person in conflict with others. This is what is basically happening anyway, but, but not blatantly. I'm not sure people realize that this is what's going on. Jesus is the new person who steps into the middle of a family and changes everything. He walks in the front door and he makes himself at home and then begins uh, to put the home in order according to his will and according to his truth. Our homes are under his management. Um, 
So what are we willing to do to keep peace with other family members at the expense of peace with Jesus? Or what are we willing to, to do to keep peace with Jesus at the expense of peace with our family members? This is a quote that he is using here uh, from Micah chapter 7 and verse 6. In context, Micah is bemoaning the fact that there is no righteous person among them. He compares it to a group or to a grape picker who has no good grape clusters to pick. There are no choice ripe figs to have. The best is like a briar. In chapter 7 and verse 5, he tells us, this is Micah, he tells us not to trust in a neighbor or have confidence in a friend or even our spouses. Um, he uses the term here, her who lives in our bosom. We are to guard our lips. How sad when there is no one to trust. Now that's the context of the statement that Jesus is referring to based on Micah chapter 7. Well, this is the scene that Jesus is uh, painting for his apostles. He knows that they cannot even fully trust one another. Must we live our lives not fully confident in a band of brothers? But our, but our hearts long for such a band, such a friend, for such a friendship, such close relationships. But perhaps it is unattainable and we must live in a, in a, with a reservation, knowing that it is impossible to completely attain in this life. Note a very similar teaching is given in Luke chapter 12, but in a seemingly different context. We'll follow that up later. The heart of discipleship is found in Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 39. Jesus gives his he who statements. He who statements. <coughs> the first statement is found where he says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus began this section telling, talking about finding the worthy house. Think of the shift from loving a parent, especially a loving, caring parent who may not believe in Jesus, to loving Jesus more even to the point of having to make extreme choices based on this superior love. How could Jesus demand such love from us? Because of who he is. What only he can, can do for us. Number two, two, he says, he who loves son or daughter more than he, more than me is not worthy of me. This one seems more critical than the last. Of course, that decision would not have to be made with minor children, but it is. How often do we see parents make decisions to attend parties, ball games, classes, outings with their children so as to not disappoint them instead of attending church? This is subtle and hard to nail down. We, we don't want to be guilty of making rules where there are none, but we also show what we value by the choices that we make. Putting Jesus and the, and the church or the kingdom first is fundamental to our following him. Our children need to know that, just like they should know that the husband-wife relationship um, comes before the parent-child relationship. Because if mom and dad are not stable, then the children are not stable either. So our relationship with Jesus is primary to all stability in life. The, the, the greater... Um, the, 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 the choices are that we, we show how we deny Jesus by the choices that we actually make in our lives. In my opinion, there needs to be a hard look at the way families look at the role of children in the home. We seem to have some very different way of guiding choices uh, where we, that we make regarding our children. 
uh, instead of what Jesus is teaching here. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 38, Jesus talks of taking our cross and following him and making us worthy of him. To follow Jesus, who was in, in theory already carrying the cross towards death, required his disciples to carry their own crosses to their own death. Jesus takes um, following quite literally. Go where he is going. That's what he means. He is going to die for us. So we go to die for him. And of course, for one another. Now in this section, I'll give you some principles that are found. Number one, a disciple must first take his cross. It is not simply imposed on him without choice. Disciples choose crosses and death because of Jesus. Jesus, just as no man took Jesus's life, he, he laid it down freely. So we lay down our own lives for the sake of Jesus and the gospel. Um, It's like us picking out the gun that you, you want to be shot with or the knife that you want to be stabbed with. Let's go to the store and pick out our cross that we want to die on instead of the cross you wish to wear around your neck. Number two, the cross will be your cross. Jesus has one, his, and now it's time for us to have our cross. A personal one. Remind me of the mission where the man drags all his stuff up the mountain. Uh, that was the movie called The Mission. Uh, great movie. The cross is an instrument of death. Our death. My death. I can't carry your cross for you, nor you for me. But many have trouble accepting the cross and owning it. Many are too afraid to die or too... Or too in control to die, or too stubborn to die. But death belongs to each of us, and we must own it. Number three, in following, we have a cross to drag along with us. Imagine Jesus on the Via Della Rosa, the way of tears, dragging a heavy cross and stumbling under his weight. See his bloody knees, his skinned elbows. See the skin scraped off his shoulders and back from the rough cross. Imagine how awkward carrying a cross must be. Imagine how tired he became and the help he needed at times. And Simon coming alongside. Imagine your blood dripping on the stone streets, of, stone streets of Jerusalem and your nail pierced hands and feet. Drag it, own it, it's yours. The simple word follow in many ways uh, defines our appropriate response to Jesus. The word is very simple to understand. To follow someone, you have to, number one, we have to pay attention to them. Number two, we have to do so constantly or you will lose them. And number three, you have to stay behind them. You can't follow um, from the lead. And number four, you do what they do and go where they go. You turn when they turn and say what they say. Literally, it means to be in the same way with, uh, to accompany. Um, an it, it means to be an attendant, to be together, to be in the way with someone. The general senses in which this word are used are many. I'm going to give you a few uh, passages that you can research on your own. In Matthew chapter 8, uh, this is in the general sense. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, the multitudes followed him. In Matthew 9, 19, Jesus followed the synagogue officials. In John 11, 31, Jesus followed uh, many. Now, those are general ways in which the word is used, but specifically to follow a teacher or, or to be a disciple, uh, here are some ways that it's used. First of all, uh, to personally follow him. To follow him where? Well, in Matthew 4, verse 20, Peter and Andrew left their nets and followed in Matthew 4, verse 22, James and John left their boat and they followed. In Matthew 4, verse 25, great multitudes followed. 
In Matthew 9 and verse 9, Matthew rose from his tax collector booth and followed Jesus. In Matthew 19, verses 27 and 28, Peter says, we have left everything and followed you. Those who have followed, he says, will sit on thrones. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 55, there were women there who followed Jesus. Now, there are also some very specific ways in which this word is used of a disciple. In Matthew 10, verse 38, this is our verse of where we follow Jesus. Matthew 16, verse 24. Here Jesus says, deny self, take up cross, up a cross and follow if you wish to come after him. In Matthew 8, verse 34, we have the same statement. In Matthew 9, verse 23, the same statement. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus says, whoever follows uh, Jesus will never walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And then in John 12 and verse 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there shall my servant be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now these six verses comprise the crux of our relationship with Jesus. As disciples, we have a great obligation. To be a follower means, number one, to deny self and to do so daily. Number two means to take up our cross daily. It means to follow, number three. It, num number four, it means to walk in the light. And in number five, it means that we are to serve. All of those come out of those passages that talk about how a disciple is committed to following Jesus. So really, am I a follower? I, can't, uh, I certainly walk into situations uh, that are difficult and trying. But why do I do that? Did Jesus lead me there? Or did I go and then ask him to join me or get me out of it? How does anyone really know this? Even when the disciples awoke each morning and physically followed Jesus to, the, to this place or that place, were they simply, uh, simply following by being there? It, it seems that so much of their time uh, there was watching him do things. They watched him teach. They watched him preach. They watched him heal. And what does it really look like? This following Jesus, what does it look like? There are certainly things I tacitly say no to when I could possibly say yes, but is it because I just can't do it or is it selfishness? For instance, I have looked forward to three days off, most do, but should I be off? Even in off, I have plans to have folks over and to participate in fundraising and do other things. And so, what does it mean to follow Jesus? It just sometimes seems fuzzy and leaves much judgment to us as to what it means. Judgment that gets turned to others about whether uh, they are true followers or not. Because we tend to compare ourselves and we say, well, I'm following Jesus because I do this, this, and this. And sometimes we say, or at least think about others, well, they're not following Jesus because they don't do this, this, and this. Well, Jesus says, unless we take up our cross and follow, we are not worthy of him. Who could be even worthy of Jesus? As I have seen throughout the study, Jesus points out appropriate and inappropriate responses people have to him. The insincere, dismissive responses, responses show people do not, get, do not get it. The person who sells all he has to have Jesus gets it. They, seem, they see Jesus for who he is and know that the only right response is to embrace him fully by denial of self. Confession of Jesus is appropriate. Praise Worship, service, sacrifice, joy, reception, etc. are appropriate. So follow. Do I? Have I? Will I? 
If not, what must I do to be a follower? I know some things that nag at me to change. Other things I wonder if I'm doing the most important things. God, give me wisdom to know if I am following you and your son to the best of my ability. I desire to do so because I love you. Well, this business of following Jesus and knowing what it means to follow Jesus is a very difficult concept when we apply it practically to our lives. And I'm just saying today that I think we all need to sit back and, and take, some, take some stock of our lives and ask some very fundamental questions about what does it mean to follow Jesus? Going back and looking at specifically what he says that it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Because, again, we can be so, we can be so uh, religious. We can even love God. We can attend church. We can, be a part, we can be a part of many different things that are spiritual in nature and still not really consider if we're following Jesus the way he meant for us to follow him. Well, thank you for joining us today. We'll try to finish this section next time we get together. But again, God bless you. Take care. And we'll talk to you later.